Thank you, Your Honor. State Post Dave Lawrence. <coughs> Have a seat, please, sir. Once you're seated, state your full name, spelling, and last. David, middle initial M, Lawrence, L A W R E N C E. Are you used to be Lieutenant Lawrence? Yes, sir. Are you retired now? I am. Uh, if you would, what are you doing now in your retirement? Um, I have a uh, contract polygraph examination services I do for different entities. Does that include Lexington? It does. What law enforcement experience do you have? Um, <clears throat> I started, um, I grew up in a little small town in Johnsonville down in Florence County uh, where I was a uh, a dispatcher and a part-time police officer and an emergency medical technician, EMT, with uh, my local rescue squad. I later went to Richland County Sheriff's Department, spent about 13, 14 years with them, and then went to SLED in uh, May of 99, and um, spent the rest of my career with SLED. I did retire and came back about four years. And then after that also, I served as the um, interim inspector general out of the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice. Back in August of 2014, were you with SLED? I was. What was your rank there and what did you do? I was a lieutenant in the Midlands region, which is in investigative services. As lieutenant for the Midlands region, were you called upon to become involved in the case involving Mr. Tim Jones. Yes, sir, I was. Do you recall going to Mississippi and Alabama on this case? I do. Who did you go with? Um, I went with um, Lexington County um, Investigative Sergeant Adam Creech and FBI Agent Dave Mackey. What day did y'all get to Mississippi? Uh, we got to uh, Mississippi on September the 8th. September the 8th. Of 2014. Yes, sir. Mm. On that date, did, uh, was an interview conducted with Mr. Jones? Yes, the interview was conducted by um, Agent Mackey and Sergeant Creech. And you were not involved, directly involved in that interview? I, I was not. After that interview, what information was shared with you about what the defendant had said? Um, I was briefed by Sergeant Creech who um, informed me that Jones had um, admitted to killing his five children and had agreed to try to help locate the bodies. Now, when the interview on the 8th was conducted, what time of day roughly was it? Um, it was late that afternoon whenever we got there. Um, this was into the night. Um, it had to be probably 8, 9 o'clock p.m. at least or so. Um, that would be Central Standard Time as well. Was any effort made to travel to find the bodies that night or did y'all wait for the next day? No, it, it was nighttime. And by the information I'd received, the, the bodies were still quite a ways away from where we were. So we said, well, obviously, you know, we need to wait to daylight hours. Next day, did you have a briefing before you left? We did. Um, Jones was brought over to a, like a conference room there at the courthouse, which is in the still complex of the sheriff's office and um, in the detention center. And uh, we, we did, several of us were there, uh, myself, um, Agent Mackey, Sergeant Creech, uh, several other Mississippi State um, investigators, you know, were there. and. We were trying to look at some maps and Google Earth searches, images, uh, and trying to get somewhat of a general idea of the vicinity of where we were, you know, going. And did y'all at some point get in your various vehicles and start heading towards Alabama? 
We did. Um, there was obviously was a, a caravan, uh, so to speak. Um, I drove Agent Mackey Ray with me. Uh, we were directly behind a marked patrol unit that had Jones and Sergeant Creech in it, and there was at, at least two other, two to three other vehicles as well too. That was with um, the Mississippi State. Um, police officers, uh, as well as the sheriff of Smith County, yeah, Mississippi as well. About how long a ride was this, or about how far did y'all have to get? <clears throat> it was, excuse me, it was quite a ways. Um, we traveled, uh, what I thought certainly at the time, between 175 to maybe 200 miles away from where the sheriff's office was, where we actually started. Did y'all make any stops along the way? Uh, we did when we left the sheriff's office and got out to I-20. Um, at, at the interstate, uh, we stopped uh, at the convenience store. Everybody wanted to make sure the vehicles were gassed up. Uh, we didn't know how far we were going to be going. And um, also, uh, during that time, um, I actually bought um, Jones uh, something to eat from Taco Bell. That was for the ride? Yes, sir. It was, um, that was around, at that time, that was around about 12, you know, 45 p.m. or so. Again, Central Standard Time um, that, that we were there, and that was at the time that I had purchased him something to eat. About what time did y'all actually get to where the children's bodies were? It was closer between like 2.30 to, to 3 p.m. at that time. So it's several hours after you had made that stop to get him some food? It was several hours. We went down I-20 East to um, to Meridian, Mississippi, and then took Highway 19 to Highway 10, and uh, went quite a ways until we got some area where they refer to as uh, Oak Hill, between Camden and Greenville, Alabama. How would you describe that area? It was very remote. Um, we went for miles on end, you know, without seeing houses, and then maybe you may see one. Um, but it was um, an e extreme rural area, more than what we have here in Lexington County. Did y'all at any time have to uh, stop, turn around, make any U-turns or do anything like that? Well, as we got on Highway 10, and obviously it was quite a ways in, uh, like I said, uh, I was driving a vehicle that was directly behind the patrol car that was carrying uh, Jones. Uh, they slowed down two or three times um, because we were in the, an area, uh, if I could maybe try to describe it to you, um, wooded area, two-lane highway, and they had several, um, like, dirt um, driveway, so to speak, off of it, as if you were about to enter a hunting club. Um, is what it was, and they all looked the same. And the car slowed down a couple of times, and we actually turned around and went into one of them just for a brief moment. Nobody even got out, it was so brief. And then uh, the patrol car just got back on the highway and proceeded on, so we said, obviously, this is not where it is. It just, again, we were letting him try to direct us to where we were going. Is that the only time y'all had to regroup and uh, kind of had a miscue? It was. How'd that strike you, sir? Well, I said, um, I can understand, you know, it, 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 this area looks, you know, the same, but obviously, you know, that wasn't where we were supposed to go. So again, we were letting him lead us to wherever, you know, we were going. Prior to this, was all the information from him that he had only been down that road one time before, and that was to dump the bodies of his children? As I recall, that is correct. So now you're going in the opposite direction, and he was able to get you there? Yeah, and and that's one, that's one thing I was obviously impressed with, the fact that he was taking us to these bodies in the reverse order from where he originated from to where he had dumped them off. So... Um, yeah, we, we didn't go back to where the original you know, location was, where apparently where the children were killed. We were going from the location where he had gotten arrested back to the bodies. So yeah, we were in reverse order at, at trying to locate these bodies. You finally turned on the appropriate dirt road to, to locate these bodies. How would you describe that road and, and the drive 
in that area. Um, the road again kind of looks similar to where we actually turned around, but it was a, um, again, a, a dirt kind of gravel road. Uh, again, it looked as though that you were going into an area that might be, you know, somebody's hunt club. And we drove about 40 to 50 yards or so off of the highway until we got to, which was woods on both sides of, of the road. We got to an area that was um, much more open. Uh, it appeared to be clear cut, been logged at one time, um, clay, dirt, and um, we actually stopped the vehicles. And whenever I saw the um, the patrol car doors come open, I thought, oh, okay, well, we are we actually going to get out on foot and and then look. And when you got out, about how far away? Were the bodies of these children located? There were at least another 100 yards, maybe 150 yards away from where we actually stopped after driving about 40 or 50 yards off of the road. <clears throat> and do you recall Mr. Jones at some point pointing out the direction of where those bodies are? I do. About how far away was he from where the the bags of these children were actually located. <clears throat> Excuse me, you had to walk, um, you know, a ways, but whenever he got out of the car, uh, he, it, 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 he didn't wander around. He just walked almost like directly, you know, to a location um, that was in the uh, brushy, again, kind of clear-cut area. And probably, as, if I can try to illustrate something, uh, maybe about as far as where you're standing, Mr. Hubbard, to the back of the courtroom. Okay. Once he did that, where did Tim Jones get? Uh, we made a decision then that uh, he needed to leave the scene. So um, Sergeant Creech um, and the officers who were in the MART unit, uh, would, they said, go ahead and take him back and myself and um, uh, Agent Mackey stayed at the location. Let's talk about that for just a minute now. Who all was at the scene at this point? Uh, it was uh, Sergeant Creech, Jones, two uniform officers from Smith County Sheriff's Office, um, Sheriff Charlie Crumpton, um, two agents from the Mississippi State um, Bureau of Investigation, Myself, uh, Dave, uh, Agent Mackey, and it was very close to that time that a Alabama state trooper came up. Once an Alabama trooper came up, did other officers start arriving from local law enforcement? Yes. Let's talk about that. Is there a lot of officers showing up on that scene? There was a lot of officers who showed up after that. Is that one of the reasons why Sheriff Crumpton wanted to get Tim Jones out of that area before the crowd came? Yes, and th there was really no need for him to stay there in any longer at that point, and he just needed to be, you know, taken back to, you know, where we came from. You mentioned Sergeant Creech went back with the defendant. That's right. He stayed with him the whole time. As a sled agent, a lieutenant, who was the commanding officer on that scene? Well, at that time I was. What was your responsibility as far as those bags that contain what we now know are the bodies of the children and that whole scene? Um, like you, we, we just stated earlier, um, obviously whenever uh, we, we discovered the, the bags there, uh, the, the state trooper that was there with us um, notified a coroner's office. And we ended up notifying two coroner's offices because we weren't even exactly <coughs> sure what county we were even in. And then obviously he called, contacted his superiors. And then, yes, um, quite a few officials from the local sheriff's office, the Alabama State Police, came and next thing I knew there were two helicopters flying over us. They were dropping off um, uh, Alabama State uh, law enforcement officials in suits um, that were there. So obviously the word had got out that, you know, 
Um, five uh, dead bodies of children have been located in this remote area of Alabama, so yes, quite a few people showed up. Now that all these other officials know that there's dead bodies, dead children on Alabama soil, but you had information from the confession from the day before the murder happened in South Carolina, what was your role? Well, the role then, you know, is this. Um, you know, this is a situation where you're in somebody else's jurisdiction, but that wasn't necessarily where the actual crime of the killings actually took place. Um, based to, at that time, we had information and we had reason to believe that the children, you know, were killed in Lexington County. So we were going to have to make a, a very methodical, coordinated effort uh, with the local authorities and with us. And what um, I was discussing with the Alabama state and the local authorities there is that even though this is in your jurisdiction, I would really prefer if I were crime scene <laughs> from Lexington County Sheriff's Office and from SLED came and participated in the initial processing of the crime scene. Um, so, um, and as, as well as uh, coordinating with the coroner's office there and the coroner's office here and coordinating with the prosecutor's office in that jurisdiction and our prosecutor's office here because I, I knew this was going to be a, you know, a joint effort and yeah, we, we've got five dead bodies and I was just asking everybody if we just please can we cooperate, let's put this thing together like we're supposed to. That take you a while to make sure everybody understood you needed to be running this scene? It did. Um, we even had the, the actual um, acting chief of the Alabama State um, Bureau of Investigation was there. And um, we had to coordinate that. Um, I actually contacted Mr. Hubbard, who was the deputy solicitor at that time, to have him contact the prosecutor in that jurisdiction to coordinate that. And we actually had the coroner, two coroners from that jurisdiction, contact the acting coroner here in Lexington County to coordinate um, how, what we were going to transport, you know, the bodies. Um, so, yeah, it was a rather extensive coordination effort there on everybody's behalf. And obviously, they're, they're very eager themselves uh, to process this crime scene because, again, you know, you, you've got five dead bodies. That's, in your jurisdiction, so yeah, it was it was quite a coordinated effort. About what time did you get on that scene now? Uh, we got there between maybe 2.30, 3 o'clock or so. Now, like that. SLED CSI, Brittany Burke, we've heard from earlier, and the CSI agent with Lexington County, about what time did they get on the scene? Uh, they didn't get to us until almost uh, 7 p.m. Again, Central Standard Time. So you had to hold that scene until then? Correct. While you're waiting, did y'all mark off the scene, do any kind of crime scene tape? Yeah, the state trooper um, from Alabama, Trooper Morgan, he and I just put up some crime scene tape between two trees. Um, that was kind of like a little ways away, but then again, you know, we're in a big open area. And, um, and also during that time, I'd ask the um, Alabama state authorities, well, would they take some um, aerial photographs and footage for us since they had two helicopters there? And then the, um, the Alabama state police on a crime scene, uh, we asked if you could, them, they just participate in kind of like just an out of perimeter cursive search to see if we saw anything around where we were, not the immediate area where the bags were, but in the, like the outer perimeter area during that time. Is there anything specifically you're looking for? Uh, we did have some information about some possibility of some saws or saw blades on that information. Uh, we did look uh, for anything such as that or anything else that may be of any kind of evidentiary value, um, but we did not locate anything to actually call asking one of the Alabama State Crime Scene guys days after that, would he send another team out there even after we left and see if they would just search again. And that turned out to be with negative results as well. 
you're, you're there during the daylight hours. What's the weather like and, and how's it like out there? It was September. We're in Alabama. It was hot. Um, it was very hot. It was very dry, very hot. I want to show you what's been previously marked, the state's ID 206. <coughs> See if you recognize this. I do. How do you recognize it? Um, this is a compact disc um, that I actually um, initialed um, just a few days ago as well as um, viewed it a few days ago. <coughs> And what is this for? It is a um, video of um, as if you were walking up to the uh, bags that were in the woods. Yeah, I move this into evidence. For trial objection, noted. It'll be admitted. If I make problems. Right. Bags weren't just on the side of the road or just slightly off this road. They were way on up. Yes, sir. Besides the visual senses you used to find these bags, was there anything else? The smell. How would you describe that? Uh, des des describe the smell. Uh, well, it is um, a smell of uh, obviously decomposed um, human remains, and there's several, I guess, illustrations I could use to try to relate it to you, so you could. But it was it was horrendous. And when CSI got there, um, you said that was about seven o'clock? Correct. Was it getting dark or was it still daylight that time of the year? Uh, it was the beginning um, to get dusk and um, nearing dark. What did you do? What, if anything, did you do and the other officers on the scene to assist CSI? Well, I'd asked the, um, I, I knew it was going to take a while again for our, our crime scene to get there, so I'd asked the um, Alabama state authorities, would they try to get us a, a light source? Because I knew we would be into the night, you know, with these. And um, the, again, I knew we were going to be there for a while. So they, they were able to provide um, some uh, light source, you know, for us, I think through the local fire department. And um, then at that time, I, um, <clears throat> we wanted to, first of all, obviously make sure what was actually inside of the bags without disturbing him no more than what we had to. So uh, one of the coroners, and I asked him, would he provide some body bags for us? And uh, they did. So uh, after uh, a lot of photography, and um, Burke, uh, Ms. Burke wrote labeling, uh, you know, the bags and in, in, the, in the immediate area. Uh, that's whenever we started slowly um, taking each bag one at a time, uh, lifting it no more than what we had to and putting it on the open unzipped body bag. Um, Cause we want to make sure we were trying to preserve everything we could, want to try to lose anything. And it was after we had placed it on the um, the open body bag that we um, cut or opened the bags uh, as much as we could to actually see what was actually inside of it. Was it your intention to actually pull out the bodies from the bags or just to identify if there's human remains? Um, no, I, I, we wanted to make sure what was in the bags, you know, to begin with. So immediately when we were able to identify what appeared to be that of a, of a human body, that's where we stopped. 
zip the, the body bags up, and then label them accordingly. And that's what we did actually one by one on each one. So that's why I knew we were gonna be there for a while. And we were trying to preserve everything that we possibly can. But um, again, only be able to do that enough so we could identify that there was a, a, a body in the bag. Did you participate in lifting those bags up, putting them on the body bags? I did. Was it at your direction that the bags were open? They were. And were you there to see what the contents were? I did. I'd like to show you some photographs. Okay. This began with state ID 207 and as a reference point, we're going to use what's already in evidence, state 160. Okay. These placards that are on these bags, who put these placards there? Uh, Miss Burke did. It's one, two, three, four, five. Does each number stay with the child that's in that bag? It did. All the way to all tops. Correct. So let's look at number one. Who we have since identified as Elias Jones. And this bag that I've got him in, is that your initial on this gold bag? It is. Show you two photos, states ID 207A and B. And these show bag one and the open content. They do. And I'll offer these enough. Open objection. Look at 207A and B. 207A, how the bag is found. 207B, when it's on the body bag. That's correct. I don't know if I made a public. Right. Let's look at And again, sir, y'all didn't open the bags up completely, did you? Uh, no, sir, we did not. Your purpose was simply to identify human remains at that point? That's correct. So number one who's been identified is Elias Jones. I'd like to look at number two, and again referencing states 160, placard number two. It's now identified as Mira Jones. States ID 208, two photographs, 208A and B. Does this show the same process, how the bag's found, and then on the body bag? They do. I'll offer these in evidence. Up to the objection. I may publish. Right. So A is how the bag is found, and then B is the slide opening so you can confirm the remains of Mira Jones? That's correct. Number three. been identified as Gabriel Jones. States for ID 209. It's got four photographs. For these to pick the bags, or this bag as it makes its way to the body bag, and then the opening. 
They do. Now, you've got four photographs. When you initially opened the bag, did you see the body in the bag? Uh, you could not on this one. No, there was, as you can see, there was appeared to be some type of bedding uh, quilt like there, there, as you can see. So we, we actually had to um, probe around just a little bit more to actually see what was in that bag. And we actually did have to cut that one open as opposed to, you see that there's the previous two. Um, but yeah, we actually did have to cut that one open. Now I'm to that one. So you object. Looking at A and B, this is just the bag, unopened bag, as you found it, and as it's now sitting on the body bag? That's correct. And it's not opened at this point? It is not. Now looking at C and D. C is when you open it, saw the bedding, and D is when you notice or were able to locate human remains. That's correct. So this again would be Gabriel? That would be number three Gabriel, yes. Move on to number four, and identified as Abigail Jones. States ID 210, two photos, A and B. A showed where it was found, and then B, the open bag. That's correct. Move these in the oven. Subject objection. Again, A is how it's found, B's open bag. Correct. Okay. Finally, number five, been identified as Natan, Natan Jones. States ID 211. Again, you see in your initials on this bag? Correct. Your initials are on every bag containing these photographs, are they not? They are. Got it. 211 A, B, C, and D. So again, this bag was not opened uh, by wildlife or animals? It was not. Looking at A and B. Is that how the bag is found and then the bag on the body bag? That's correct. C and D, when you open the bag, did you see the body? We could not. This one had some more um, bedding that appeared to be some type of a quilt or sleeping bag like type item. The 211D for ID, is that when you see the child that we now know is in the top? That's correct. Move these in the evidence. A and B, A is how you found it, B is now the bag on the body bag. Correct. C and D, 
C is when you open it to see bedding. D is when you see that we now believe is Natan. That's correct. Your Honor, may we take a break at this time, right? We'll step in the jury room for a few minutes. We'll talk about the case. Maybe things will flow a little better now. Right. All right, solicitor, make your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Lieutenant, about what time, after y'all finished identifying remains in each and every bag, about what time did y'all wrap up and you leave that scene? Uh, we ended up leaving about 10:30 uh, p.m. When did you get back to South Carolina? Uh, we stayed somewhere in Meridian, Mississippi, and then drove back the next day. Lieutenant, in your 30 years, have you ever had a case where children were left by their killer in such a remote area? Okay. <clears throat> Recharacterize that, please. Have you had a case where someone who has disposed of bodies have left them in such a remote area. Children. I have not. In your 30 years, have you ever been called upon to open garbage bags to identify the remains of children until this case? I have not. In your 30 years. And I've seen a lot of dead bodies. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Lieutenant Lawrence, you mentioned that I guess you do private polygraphs now or have a contract after retiring. I do. And that was part of your job at SLED? Don't, a, a very small part of my job at SLED. I, I ran very few polygraphs while I was there. How long have you been a polygrapher? Since 1993. And you took your polygraphy equipment with you to Mississippi? I did. Never used it, correct? Did not. No one asked you to use it? Did not. And once you got there, I think you had an initial meeting on the 8th um, with the law enforcement there, correct? That's correct. And then you met with Tim Sr. and Julie Jones? I did. And that's Tim's father and his stepmother? Correct. And y'all discussed him. Yeah, that that was very brief. That, that we we just had a conversation about yeah, him. And I guess his family history. Some, yeah. And this is all before you know that the children are dead, correct? Uh, that was at the same time that um, Agent Creech, uh, or Agent Mackey, and Sergeant Creech were conducting an interview with, with with Mr. Jones. And Tim Senior and Julie were obviously concerned. Well, they were there. And they answered any question that you asked them? As I can recall. And, and in fact, they did everything that you had asked them. You felt comfortable if you went back to them, they would have answered anything that you wanted, correct? I don't know if I can say that. I can only say, just, I mean, it was a very brief conversation that we have, and it was in general, and it was a small talk, you know, as well, too. And, um, Obviously, I think that even at that time, they were trying to find out exactly what was going on. And so then on the 9th, um, I believe you were with Tim when he was reviewing maps, uh, maybe even Google Earth. I, I was in the conference room whenever that was going on. And he was cooperative. He was. <clears throat> and I think the solicitor had asked you about um, this area in Alabama, and you said that it was extremely rural. That's correct. And that you went for miles without seeing any houses. Uh, it was very sporadic, but yeah, I mean, we would see one occasionally, but yeah, there was like miles on end before you would see one. And it would have been difficult to find those children without Tim's help. Yes, it would. <coughs> no further questions. Nothing further, Your Honor. We step down. Thank you.
Member, at this time, the state is going to introduce and publish Mr. Jones' conviction from Illinois. All right. Have um, several court exhibits that are in pre marked. I'll put those in now for the record. That's 114, 115, 116, and 117. Those are court exhibits. Those are, the, those are the records from the state of Illinois admitted. The, I have one, two, four. I have five um, certified convictions, Your Honor, that have been pre marked. 295, Your Honor, is a conviction from. McHenry County Clerk of Circuit Court. We would do that into evidence and publish. It would be 295, 292, 293, 291, and 294. Those are all currently marked as state's ID, and we need all of those in evidence at this time. No objection to those files. 291, 292, 293, 294, and 295 admitted, which are prior convictions from the state of Illinois. Permission to publish your honor. Sure. 295 is a conviction for possession of cocaine. The offense date was March 30th of 2001. The disposition date was March 14th of 2002. A one year sentence. States 292 is a conviction for burglary. An offense date of September 3rd of 2001, a conviction date of March 14th of 2002, a sentence of six years with restitution and boot camp. 293, a conviction for forgery, an offense date of September 13th of 2001, a conviction date of March 14th of 2002, a fine five-year sentence in the Department of Corrections in boot camp. 291, a conviction for receiving or possession of a stolen vehicle, an offense date of September 15th of 2001, a conviction date of March 14th of 2002, a six-year sentence in boot camp. 294, a conviction for theft, an offense date of September 15th of 2001, a disposition date of March 14th of 2002, a sentence of six years in boot camp. All right, so let's read the indictment so it's clear as to um, the natures of the offenses. And the reason I'm doing this, Illinois may define something differently than South Carolina does. So it's confusing. So the indictment kind of outlines the subject matter with a little more detail so you can understand what exactly you did. For all the indictments, you're just the one, Your Honor. All of just one. Just the one. Just that one. Mm -hmm. States 292 was a conviction for burglary. The indictment reads that on or about September 3rd, 2001, in McHenry County, State of Illinois, Timothy R. Jones committed the offense of burglary in that the said defendant, without authority, knowingly entered a 1987 Dodge automobile bearing Illinois registration number J565521, located at 197 Northwest Highway, Cary, McHenry County, Illinois, with the intent to commit their end of theft. All right. Continuing on, Your Honor. Yes, sir. The state will call Shelby Derrick to the stand. She's still on the road. Please state your name. <coughs> yeah.
Shelby, Derek, D E R R I C K. She testified earlier. So Ms. Derek, you're still on the road. Mr. Derek, back in 2014, you were working with the crime scene with the Lexington County Sheriff's Department, correct? Yes, sir. And earlier, you had testified, I think, that on September 8th of 2014, that you came into possession of Amber Jones's phone and that you did an extraction on the phone. Is that correct? Um. I believe so. I'm not sure if I testified to that or not, but I did come into contact with her cell phone, yes. Okay. So you were asked to do an extraction on the phone? Yes, sir. Um, which is where you pull off the information on there, correct? Yes, sir. We extract data off the phone. Let me show you um, several photographs and ask if you recognize these. Those photographs that you pulled off of. Ms. Kaiser's phone. Yes, there they are. Your Honor, the state um, has pre-marked these. They're all marked for ID, and they'll be published with a later witness. But for the record, they're states 222 for ID. States 220 and 221 currently are for ID. States 219 for ID. And states 218 for ID. Okay, those are ID only. Been identified. In addition to those photographs, um, let me show you two discs which have previously been marked as. States 188 for ID and 189 for ID. And ask if you've had an opportunity to look at this and verify that those um, video recordings came off of Amber Jones' time. Yes, sir, I did. And I have my initials on them. Your Honor, the state would move 188 and 189 from ID and evidence at this time. No objection. No objection. 188. And 189, the video from Ms. Kaiser's phone admitted without objection. previously identified by Amber Kaiser as a video clip containing her daughter Mira and also the defendant Tim Jones Jr. Are you aware from your extraction of the phone the date or time that that video what can you tell me about when that video was video clip was created? The dates they were created or the dates I extracted them? Both. Okay. Say both. Um, on uh, it was September 8th um, is when I actually did or started the extraction. Sometimes it takes a little longer, maybe um, a couple days, depending on the type of phone. Um, we hook it to, um, I think I believe y'all have heard about the Cellbrite before in previous testimony. Um, it was a track phone, which is a type of cell phone, so I hooked it into the system, and it downloaded the extraction and took a little time so once i got all the data together um i transferred it from the u.s little v drive the little disc that comes with it and placed them on the actual disc that were placed into evidence um so that file transfer from 
the cell right to the disc was on September 11th. And when you look at the properties in, of that file, it shows a modified date of June 16th of 2013 at 2.25 p.m. What, can you, what does that mean? Um, usually, I, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with computers, but usually when you pull up a property of a photograph or a video, um, it'll have the date you accessed it or the date that you transferred it. Um, it also has a, a um, modified date or created date. Um, that was the actual date that the device itself either saved it or viewed it or received it. Um, of course, there's a lot more data that goes with that file that you have to have special programs to read. But as far as the properties on the computer, it says, I believe one is 621-2013. I'm not sure the actual, I think I, they're written on the DVDs, but they're written on the DVDs. One order. Sure that's one of the properties okay, out, yeah. and that's for all right. uh, which is 188, and that showed a modified date of... That's, um, it was viewed or on the device, either saved or last viewed, um, June 16th of it was sent um, via text message from another cell phone. States 189 showed Elias and Tim Jones Jr. as well. Were you able to look at the properties on that one? Yes. Um, the created and access date are the same as September 11th as the one before, because that's when I put them or placed them on the, the disk, transferred them. The actual date it was either saved or accessed on the device itself, um, being Amber's cell phone, was June 7th of 2014. Permission to publish this, Your Honor? Yes, sir. One thing that the state was going to present the defense for reviewing it first. Y'all step in the jury room, they'll review it, we'll bring y'all back in here and present that. So don't discuss the case, but step in the jury room, have you right back out here. 